In the matter of half a dozen years, we went from 25 wells to over 200 wells. And that really, really changed life for us. We went from living on a farm to living in a refinery. The state of Wyoming now has, just in the Powder River Basin alone, 3,000 abandoned coal bed methane wells that the taxpayers of the state of Wyoming are going to have to pay to have reclaimed. Well, now there's a whole swath of the state that looks like hell. It's covered with roads and wellheads and production tanks. And so now they bypass on the interstate highways when they go to Yellowstone National Park. And those small towns are starting to dry up. You can wipe away your history in the blink of an eye. First of all, if you, you live in a very rural, remote area, you lose all your privacy. And the use of your land is drastically altered because there's people coming and going 24 hours a day, a lot of traffic, big pieces of machinery, and people making decisions on your ground about what's happening there with no consultation with you. So it really erodes your sense of security and your sense of privacy. Um, then after that, you start to see the landscape change. With us, they dozed flat, big rock formations that have been there for thousands of years. Uh, they dug up large portions of our irrigated alfalfa fields. And then all the infrastructure goes in that we have to look at for the next however many 20 or 30 years. We had an industry that came to us and said, we want to be a part of the community. We want to be here and provide jobs. We want to be sure that your sons and your brothers and your fathers have jobs that they can depend on. And we bought it. You know, looking back, I, I guess we did see it coming and we didn't recognize it. They started sponsoring events at the school. They started sponsoring the, the rodeo at the county fair. They started working with Habitat for Humanity. And I come from a part of the world where you take people at their word. And I think a lot of people foolishly did that. And their word wasn't worth the air that came out of their mouth to make the sound. Because when things started to go wrong, they weren't anywhere to be found. This is what it looked like. This is our house. We were still building it when they started drilling real close to us. The state of Wyoming says no oil and gas drilling any closer than 350 feet to a domestic source of water. The well that you see behind the house is 370 feet. There's one just this side, you can just see the edge of the pad that's 355 feet. The one in front of the house is actually shade over 200 feet. Because we have all these great regulations, but the state of Wyoming won't hire any inspectors to come out and make sure they're actually following the regulations. So we were the ones left to try to deal with this. We were the ones left to police the land. We're the ones that have the most to lose. But when you live with this, we were complaining because the Derrick lights kept us up all night. And they said, well, we'll take you to town and buy you a hotel room for a week, 30 miles away. So right there tells you just about how much they understand what it's like to run a farm, to have animals that you're responsible for, this is what the hydrofracking process looked like from our front porch. These are small wells. So the fracking was small scale compared to a lot of the fracking that goes on. In the United States, a large portion of the chemicals that they use are exempt from disclosure. They're trade secrets. They like to say it's just like Coca-Cola's secret recipe, which is a crock of you know what. They're keeping secrets, and there's a reason they're keeping secrets, because this isn't safe. If it was safe, they'd come out and tell everybody what they're using and alleviate all of our concerns, and they refuse to do that. You don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining. And that's what they've been doing to us for a long time. This is what it's like when it takes place right behind your house. It smelled terrible, it made your eyes swell up, it made your nose burn. I guess the first health impacts I really saw were with my mother-in-law. She lost her sense of smell and her sense of taste. And at first we thought maybe it was something unique to her, but now my wife is having the same problems. 
and a lot of the neighbor ladies are losing their smell and their taste. And there's women who have neuropathy where their arms and their legs go numb. And a lot of the men suffer chronic fatigue and ringing of the ears and chronic headaches. And you know, anybody who works on a farm or a ranch, there's tired, there's working tired and they're so tired that you feel like you can't function. And that's a completely different thing. Uh, we've seen uh, mental uh, problems where people lose cognitive abilities. They lose the ability to, to speak in complete sentences and they lose the ability to, to have a clear train of thought. But I think the thing that probably disturbs me the most are, are children seem to be the most susceptible to this. Kids with nosebleeds, kids with kidney failure. You know, we, we have neighbors who, when their grandkids visit from 30 miles away, the youngest daughter or the youngest grandchild who's now five, I think, has had kidney failure three times just being at grandma and grandpa's house. We can't even hardly go outside at times because the fumes from the production tanks are horrible. We have BTEX chemicals that evaporate out of the tanks. You can taste it. My youngest son, who's now 15, he's, was three when they really started doing the heavy, heavy drilling right within 350 feet of our home, started having seizures and has spent the last 12 years of his life on anti-seizure medication, has just now given the bill of health where he can come off of his seizure medication, but it, it's more than having seizures. When a child has seizures, it affects everything that they do. He's had learning disabilities. He's had issues with physical limitations where the medicine would just make a zombie out of him. And every time we leave home, every time we go somewhere else, he'd feel better. We all feel better when we leave home. It's really disturbing. So after you survive the drilling, after you survive the fracking, after you survive people coming and going in massive truckloads of equipment up and down little gravel roads, then you've got an active gas field that has to be operated, hopefully, in some sort of correct manner. This is right above our house. This is a separation unit that actually strips the liquids out of the gas that we have. Tight sands gas, comes up with a lot of light in hydrocarbons and salt water, and it was on fire. That's triethylene glycol steaming out the top of it. Triethylene glycol, I think, boils at well over 350 degrees. It's also extremely toxic. Uh, we're the ones who find 99% of the problems that occur on our place. And then you have to try to find somebody who can come out and actually fix the problem. As a lot of you know, in salt ground, all you get are evasive weeds. So we've got ag ground that's been industrialized. We've got this crap boiling up through the ground whenever a pipe seam fails or a weld fails. This is kind of a regular occurrence around us now. We've got this whole infrastructure that's starting to fail. Our neighbor's water is black, smells like diesel fuel, or yellow and smells like diesel fuel. But the recommendations from our Center for Disease Control were don't drink the water, don't cook with the water, and if you bathe in it or wash dishes or wash laundry, open the windows of the house and ventilate it so your home doesn't explode from the methane that comes out. And as you've all seen on video clips from the United States, there's water that lights on fire, and that's the most incredible, stupid thing to see water catch on fire, but it's happening. Biggest thing we've probably seen in social ills is a massive amount of drug use and alcohol abuse that follows this. We have some of the highest drinking rates in the United States, and it goes way up when these industries come to town. Domestic violence goes up, abuse of women goes up, the quality of education goes down, hospitals are overcrowded, jails are overcrowded, Public works cannot keep up with the water and the sewer or the demands of all the man camps that come in. And after they run crazy in your town for five or six or ten years, then they leave and go somewhere else and you're left with a giant mess. And it's very hard to recover from it. The well, about 600 feet behind where this pit was dug out, they were watering some of the bulls on and went out the next morning and had five dead bulls in the field. So this began a whole series of fights and trying to prove what had happened 
and the deeper they dug, the more they found was wrong. Well, I really see a lot of the same tactics. For instance, that the, we've never had a, a incident of contaminated water from hydraulic fracturing. It's something you always hear them say. And we've had lots of instances in the United States where it's contaminated water. They ran the, the perfect setup here, and they've done it time and time again. They ran this family down until they were absolutely hanging on to the knot on the end of the rope. They had nothing left. They were out of money, their health was being affected, they couldn't raise a crop anymore, and they came in and said, okay, we will settle with you. We will buy your place, but you're gonna do something for us. And you're gonna sign a non-disclosure agreement. And from here until you die, and from here until your children die, you cannot speak about this because if you do, it will cost you $100,000 every time you speak about it. So, effectively, that evidence disappears. It's a tactic that will be used everywhere because it's a very effective way of making people go away. You know, if you want to be sure that your meat and your milk safe, you have to be sure of everything that that cow is ingesting. And what concerns me is that we're going to actually make somebody sick. And once that happens, I don't think there will be any fix in the beef industry in that part of the country. But what we've really seen in the United States is the infiltration of the groups representing a lot of the big farmers groups and beef raising groups have members now from the boards of these big corporations. But we've got a bunch of politicians that see fit to take massive massive cash donations in the United States and then turn around and do whatever industry instructs them to do. And the problem is is that these companies don't know international bounds and they've also bought the political system in the United States and it seems to me from what I've seen here and some of the papers I've read and some of the TV ads I've seen it looks pretty damn similar to what happens in our country. Politicians are looking at it for money. And a lot of these politicians, when they stop being elected by the people, are going to go to work for industry. It's a giant good old boys club, is what we call it in the States. And they stack the deck in their favor. And unless the people stand up and raise hell with them, they'll just run over the top of you because they've got it bought. I think the hardest thing to, to think about is that our kids grew up there, my wife grew up there. And it's, it's really a special place to live, and it's been destroyed by somebody who wants to make money. It wasn't about energy independence or, or making life better. It was about them making money. And now we have the prospect of having to leave because the water's contaminated. And they can never haul us enough water in five-gallon jugs to make up for what they've done. And the air is contaminated. You walk outside, you can smell the raw petroleum smell in the air. It's not worth it. There isn't any lifestyle worth being poisoned over. I mean, there's a lot of things. We've fought pretty hard for this, and we're gonna to continue to fight for it, but it really comes down to the fact that if we stay there, we're gonna poison ourselves. That's the hardest thing to deal with. Where are we gonna go, and what are we gonna do? You know, this is not a job at the local department store, and I'm not cutting down jobs like that. This is our way of life. And now the prospect is we're going to have to go someplace completely different and start over again. The thing that saddens me is I see this happening. It's not just us. I see this happening all over the United States. And now I hear stories in Australia of this happening and in Europe and in South America and Canada and Mexico. And where's it going to end? It's only going to end when the people stand up and absolutely demand that things are done differently. This is coal bed methane in the Powder River Basin. That's Australia. That's what breaks my heart. And it's not about energy independence, it's about human rights. If I drink water and breathe air and eat food, this is my business. The thing I would say is that the biggest tactic that this industry uses is to divide the people up and make them feel like they're different and make them have conflict with each other. 
It doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a rancher or a fisherman or if you work at the corner store or what you do, this will affect you in exactly the same way. Everybody gets poisoned in the same way. And if you want to have a future, if you want your children and your grandchildren and the people around you that you love and the rest of the world to be able to drink water and breathe air, you better speak up. The people of West Australia and East Australia, all parts of Australia need to stand together on this. It doesn't matter if it's coal seam gas or shale gas or tight sands, it's all the same and it has the same end results. And the people can stop this if they stick together. This is what they're going to tell you this is. That this is the pot of gold that everybody's rainbow. <laughs> I can tell you for us it's been nothing but a pot of poison. Use your voice, use your common sense and stick together. And you can save the, your way of life and you can preserve a future that's worth having for your family and your children and you can be proud that you've done that. Thank you very much. Ferguson, I'm a cattle farmer on Disputed Plains and what we just heard from John Fenton from um, Wyoming is just what we have been getting told from Tara and other people that have had similar stories happen there but they're a lot further along already and we have a chance to stop this now and it's great that everybody got to hear that so and hear that we're not making it up it's really happened in other parts because it's such an unbelievable story you think how on earth could that be true well it's happening and it is going to happen here unless we stop it and i think we will stop it hearing it firsthand at times brought tears to my eyes you know because it was very sad and if we don't do something it really is going to be bad i'm a cattle farmer i've been a farmer for 40 years it's obvious to any fool that this is an extremely detrimental process and uh, the chemicals that are brought up are health risks, serious health risks. Well, it's beyond being frightening, definitely. It's getting to the stage now rather serious and it's no good to somebody like myself that's got a heart condition. Stress is out of the question with that. This is, is obviously devastating to the water table. Um, they've been denying it for years but Food and water, a major issue in this entire debate. And John Fenton has just verified the devastation that is occurring in the United States. And our politicians really need to wake up and listen to what the majority of the people are saying in this area. To think of our, our beautiful waterways, our spring-fed dams and creeks being contaminated with industry chemicals, uh, and our families being subjected to the volatile organic compounds in the air uh, and the risk of the contamination of the food chain with the beef industry around here just horrifies me and it has reaffirmed my resolve to keep fighting this. I'm a food producer for 40 years and uh, I'm not radical, I don't like making waves, but our politicians are letting us down if they're not recognising this fact. I do think we will eventually win. We didn't think we'd be spending our old age doing this. Um, we, we just, you know, it's quite devastating for us, actually. We don't have a gas shortage. It's not to fill a hole in the in the market. It's to be exported, and there's no denial about that. That's what they want to do. It's not. We don't. We've got the biggest uptake of solar energy anywhere in Australia on the north coast. So why not continue with that vein instead of trying to push the gas issue? It's not wanted here. I never thought I'd find myself the present day involved with protesting, but we're here to look after the planet and that's intended what I intend to do. I'll do it, give it my best shot. I'll read the information that's available, there's a lot of it, and be informed. And if you have an opinion, have an informed opinion and do not listen to the politicians that are brushing it aside, have your own personal informed opinion on it. We've got to stop it for the sake of our grandchildren. I've got six grandchildren and I could not bear the thought of them growing up in, in situation that John Fenton has just come from in America. It's not going to happen here. It's not going to be their future. No way. No way.